Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody from all over the place. We're so happy to have you joining us today. Um, a belated Happy New Year to everyone. It's February 1st. We've all completed that first month of the year, so really looking forward you know, to an excellent 11 more months of this year. I don't know about you guys, but um, within UNICEF, we've been spending, you know, first part of January work planning, visioning, etc. And one of the key areas that we really want to be able to focus on, as we've always been focusing on, is how to ensure that we are working on evidence-informed programs. But before we get to that, I just want to start off by sharing some really exciting news um, that I hope that everybody has been able to see. Yesterday, uh, there was a launch in the Lancet of an excellent piece um, titled Towards a World with No Child Marriage, where we have four countries make a pledge in terms of their commitment to eliminate child marriage. The four countries are Bangladesh, Ethiopia, uh, DR Congo, and Nigeria. If you haven't seen that piece, we're projecting it right now, and I know also on the chat box we'll also share the link to it. So. Please make sure you swing by that at some point of your day today. Read it, share it, tweet it, do whatever you can. It's just great to you know, continue to have that great political will um, around the elimination of child marriage. Such a great booster and such a great way for us to be able to start the year. So please do be on the lookout for that. And I see that Christine has already shared the link um, there in the chat box for you. So colleagues, you know, every year you meet uh, myself and other UNICEF colleagues. Um, who are working hard behind, you know, not only within UNICEF, but also with our other UN agencies as well, producing a range of global goods to support evidence-based programs and policies to end child marriage around the world. So one such item which we're going to be focusing on and that I'm really excited about is, is the compilation of these country-specific child marriage data profiles. For those of you who work within this space, um, a lot of us have been talking about, you know, how do we contextualize more? How do we work more responsive to the context in, in which that we're working on? And so last year, through our data team, um, child marriage data profiles were, were developed, were circulated. I hope many of you saw that. But if you didn't, it doesn't matter. The purpose of this particular meeting today is for us to be able to go into those to see what are they, what can you be able to get out of it, and how can you use it? to enhance your programming um, over the course of this year. So the profiles are a great resource. Um, I certainly think so, and I'm really grateful to our data team for, for you know, working on that, and I hope that you also find them you know, just as useful as you do your work. The agenda for the meeting, we've already started with this great welcome. We will do a presentation of the country profiles. We're going to hear from countries. Always really good to be able to hear from those who are actually using the profiles. What has it meant to them? How have they applied them? And what are their plans in the future in terms of using those profiles? And India and Nigeria have very kindly um, agreed to take part in that. Then we're going to have a quick game, which I'm really looking forward in terms of just reading the data and seeing how you can be able to apply it. And finally, we'll open up to questions and answers and have a closing. Always important for us, of course, to hear your feedback, hear your questions, and look at how we can be able to improve um, the work that we do uh, as, as we go forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you know, our data team who are going to come on board. Um, familiar faces, I'm sure, for you, both um, Claudia, uh, who is our Senior Advisor on Statistics and Monitoring, and Colleen, who I'm sure you're also all very um, familiar with as well, who is our Statistics and Monitoring Specialist. So guys, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Nankali. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. It's always a pleasure to join hands with uh, uh, the program team colleagues um, to present the data work in the hope that this can provide uh, additional impetus to use data to stimulate action. So we are going to present today the child marriage country profiles. In particular, these profiles have been put together with the specific uh, intention to give a very quick snapshot of the situation uh, of girls and, and women when it comes to the child marriage experience. So let's go to the next slide. So they follow a standard template. So these are snapshots. Over four pages, you will find the key basic facts and statistics on child marriage in a country. 
The data are based on UNICEF global databases, which are also the same databases that are used for global reporting on the SDG, because UNICEF is the custodian agency for the SDG indicator 5.3 related to monitoring child marriage. So these databases are built over, um, they've been built over almost 15 years, uh, and they gather information coming from um, nationally representative and internationally comparable household survey conducted by the uh, national statistical offices of the countries around the world. Obviously, these databases are uh, the foundation of uh, a number of publications, including these country profiles, which are currently available for more than 80 countries. And in, the se in selecting these countries, we have obviously prioritized countries where uh, the prevalence of child marriage is uh, significant. They have been designed to provide a data-driven overview of the practice answering some common questions like how many girls and women uh, have been married in their childhood? Where is child marriage practiced most widely? And which are the girls who are most at risk? So in addition to provide an overview of the prevalence of the practice, we also, through this profile, want to give you a specific insight into the categories and the profile of girls who are most at risk of getting married in their uh, childhood. But we go also into an overview of their lives. How do child brides fare compared to their peers who have not been married or those who were married later on in life? And also very importantly, has the practice of child marriage changed over time? Is the risk of getting married in childhood decreasing? And lastly, is the country on track to eliminate child marriage by 2030? Where can we find these profiles? These profiles are available on data.unicef.org, which is the data portal of UNICEF dedicated to providing data on the situation of girls, boys, and their families around the world. So if you go on data.unicef.org, this is the first page that you will see. Then you will need to go uh, under specifically data by topic and country. So under these, um, these categories of the website, you will need to select child marriage and scroll to the resource at the bottom of the page. On the resources page, you will then uh, need to select country profiles because there are different type of country profiles available on the website on different topics. You will need to go under country profiles and then filter for child marriage. You will then land on this opening page that provide a very summary overview of the profiles. You will also find in there a document that explain how to read the country profiles. You will see the country profiles are very intuitive. They are very clear in themselves, but we also produce a short document that helps you read and interpret the profiles. And then at the bottom, as you can see, you can select the country and you can download the country profiles. These country profiles will be updated at regular intervals. So you might want to double check the date that you will see on the right hand side. And this is the date of when the profiles have been last updated. Because UNICEF databases are constantly and continuously updated through a country consultation process with the statistical offices across the world, it's always important that whenever we read data, we check the recency of the data by checking when the data products have been produced. And now I'm going to stop here because it's time to give the floor to Colleen, who will provide an in-depth overview of the profiles. Over to you, Colleen. Thank you, Claudia. So before I go into um, examples of the country profiles themselves, I do just want to highlight this document, how to read the profiles. As Claudia mentioned, it's available um, on this same resource page. 
and it's a, a simple one pager. It's relevant across all countries, and it really gives an overview of um, what are the different sections of the profiles, which um, are the indicators that are shown, and some you know basic notes on how to interpret on how to interpret the um, the findings on each one. So I'm going to go through um, examples of each section of of the profile, and I've pulled. Um, profile examples here and different charts from different profiles. You can see right here that in the first slide, I've happened to use Cameroon as an example, but as I go on through the slides, it's not always going to be um, Cameroon. So the first section of the profile um, aims to answer the question, what are the current levels of child marriage? How common is this practice? And we answer this question in a couple of ways. We start on the top left-hand side with what we call the burden of child marriage. And we use that word to, um, to describe how many in absolute total numbers, how many girls and women are affected by the practice in the country. Um, this is a number that includes both girls who are currently under 18 and they are married right now, as well as all women, women of all ages who were first married in childhood. So if they were married in childhood at any time, they're considered a child bride. And this gives us a sense of the magnitude of, um, of the practice in, in the country. After that section, we move on in the rest of the profile. We're gonna be looking at the prevalence of child marriage. So this, rather than the absolute number, this is the percentage of women who were married um, in childhood. And we use here the standard you know, SDG indicator, which is the percentage of women who are now aged 20 to 24 who were married before, before 18. And we use this indicator for comparability um, across countries. And it gives us a sense of you know, what, what share of, um, of girls are getting married when they, when they are under 18. Now we show this prevalence a few different ways. In the top right, you can see that there's a map. So we have subnational data, and that can give us a sense of which regions in, um, in the country are most affected. In the next section, where we have the regional and global comparison, we show the level in the country. So in this case, Cameroon, we can see the level is 30%. So 30% of young women were married in childhood. Now, we know that in Cameroon now the level is 30%. We can say, is that low? Is that high? You know, what's our basis for comparison here? In order to get some, some comparison, we um, can look, for example, at the country with the highest and lowest prevalence of child marriage in the region. Now in West and Central Africa, there's quite a widespread um, of levels of child marriage. We have both, you know, a country with the highest level of child marriage in the world which um, happens to be Niger. And so 76% is the absolute highest. And I think we have eight or 9% is the lowest. So Cameroon in that sense kind of falls you know, in the middle. Um, we also can compare this to the world. Right now, the world average for child marriage prevalence is, is 19%. So if I were gonna describe how common is child marriage in Cameroon, I would say you know, it's certainly higher than, um, than the global average. 30% is a very large share of girls who are, you know, who are marrying in childhood. And there are regions of the country that are much more affected than, than others. I can see particularly in a couple of these Northern regions that the levels exceed 50%. Um, but, you know, in comparison, it's not the highest level um, in the world. This page also includes um, some overview of the population groups who are most at risk of child marriage. So beyond just you know, which regions of the country are kind of hot spots for child marriage, we also can get a sense of which are the demographic populations that are more vulnerable to the practice. So in this um, chart on the lower part of the page, we have a disaggregation of child marriage prevalence according to different population groups. So how common is the practice starting with the left-hand side, among those who are um, from households of different levels of wealth, among women who have different levels of education, among women who live in urban versus rural areas. And in Cameroon, we see some pretty striking patterns here. So if I were reading the, the data on Cameroon, again, I would say, wow, this is a practice that um, is really um, 
girls have different levels of risk depending on what type of what type of family they they come from. If they're from a poorer family, their level of child marriage can be almost 60%, right? Twice the national average. Whereas women from the richest households have a much lower level of risk. It also looks like the practice is concentrated among those who don't have um, either any education or who have only primary education. And it's more common in rural areas than urban. So after this um, first page in which we look at kind of the, the overview, the bird's eye view of the practice in the country, we start looking a little bit deeper at um, the characteristics of unions. So here we want to answer the questions like, who are child brides marrying and what do their marriages look like? Are they marrying their peers or older men? Are they informal marriages or are they living together in an informal union? And again, here we're switching countries as we go through different examples. So this is not Cameroon throughout. Um, but if I were reading this graph on the, on the left-hand side, um, and I wanted to know, are child brides marrying peers or older men? I would see this chart on the left, which gives me information about the spousal age gap. And so this tells me, um, what is the difference in age between the girl and her partner? Um, on the left-hand side, we have partners who are younger, who are within five years of their age in this darker blue part, five to nine years older in this light pink. And this dark segment on the, um, on the right-hand side shows me the share that have a partner who is 10 or more years older. So this would be a particular area of, you know, of concern in terms of power dynamics in the relationship, for example. Um, and for comparison, we also see what is this kind of age distribution, this age gap distribution among the child brides, that's the top bar, versus women who marry after 18. So women who marry as adults. Now in this country, I can see that it's not uncommon for all women to have partners who are 10 or more years older, both the child brides and those who are not child brides, a substantial proportion of them have a much older um, partner. But among child brides, it looks like this is particularly common. So we have about 30% of child brides have a husband who is 10 or more years older than them. On the right-hand side, we have um, a sort of basic distribution of um, what type of union child brides are in. So this tends to vary actually a fair amount by countries. Um, we'll see that in some countries, most child marriages take the form of a formal marriage, whereas um, in other countries, it tends to be more informal unions. In this you know, sample country, we see a very large proportion of child marriages are informal unions. In the next segment of the profile here, we have this section that we're called Lives of Child Brides. And here we want to look at um, how do child brides fare in different areas of their lives? And how does that compare to their peers who didn't marry in childhood? So we're looking to answer questions like, do child brides have economic and phys physical autonomy? What are their impressions and experiences of violence? Um, are they in school? Now, these charts here, um, show a selection of key indicators and they show the result for the girls who were child brides, which is always this um, dark green bar and compares them to women who are their peers, but who did not marry in childhood, which is this, um, light, this lighter green bar if they married after 18 and the red bar if they never married. And so reading this, you know, for example, we could see that in this sample country, um, that it's very uncommon for all women, regardless of whether they're child brides or not, to have a bank account. Um, we see, for example, that most, the majority are um, employed and it looks like the child brides are more likely to be employed than um, their peers who were not child brides, um, et cetera. Looking over to the right-hand side, it's um, quite striking here, for example, that um, there's quite high levels of intimate partner violence among, again, both child brides and those who were not child brides in this in this country. This segment at the bottom here um, gives a simple chart on um, education and on whether girls are in school or out of school. Um, on the left-hand side, we see this is our child bride group. So we're looking at adolescent girls who are currently married or in union. And we see in this case that it looks like, you know, about 90% of them are, are out of school. 
which in this country is you know quite uncommon overall for adolescent girls because the ones who are not married you know most of them are in fact in school in the next segment of lives of child brides here um, we are looking at early childbearing and reproductive health outcomes so we're looking to answer questions like do child brides give birth earlier than their peers are they often pregnant before marriage do they have access to reproductive health care so the charts here will help us answer those those questions um, on the top left hand side this chart on early childbearing is telling us um, what proportion of um, of, of women who were married in childhood gave birth before age 18 and before age 20. Um, we can see that um, here, for example, on this, this left-hand bar is our child bride bar. We can see that about half of them gave birth before age 18 and almost 80% gave birth before they were 20. And in a pretty simple comparison here, we can see that while this is a very, a very common outcome for child brides, that it's less common for those who were married later. So. Um, so much fewer of their peers who were married later give birth early and the ones who were never married in this country, you know, it was even less common for them. Um, I'll point out also in this, this um, pie graph over here on the right hand side that the country profiles include analysis on the timing of pregnancy and marriage. Um, we often um, look to understand, and I think this is relevant also from you know, a programmatic point of view, we look to understand, um, are girls getting pregnant and is this driving, um, driving them to marry earlier than they would have liked to? Um, and so, for example, could pregnancy prevention be um, an intervention that could help also reduce child marriage? And so in charts here, we see of the child brides, and then again, compared to those who were not married in childhood, what share of them were pregnant before they were married or are they pregnant you know, within early, within the first year of marriage or, or after marriage? Um, and so we can see the distribution um, of, of women here depending on that, that pregnancy timing. In this country, for example, we can see that about a quarter of child brides were pregnant before they got married, this segment here. Um, in this bottom chart here, we're looking at reproductive health um, services for the most part. So we're looking at whether um, women's demand for family planning is satisfied with the modern method, whether they have access to skilled antenatal care and skilled attendant at delivery um, for those who have had who have had babies. And again, comparing is what are the overall levels of the access to these services and are they different? Are the levels different for child brides compared to those who didn't marry in childhood? To conclude the profile, we have a page that um, shows generational trends and then um, some projections to 2030. And so really here we're looking to answer the question, has child marriage become less common over time? Um, in this country, for example, we can see that, um, that child marriage has become you know, much less common as you know, almost halved. Um, in general, we're showing this trend over about 25 years. We know that you know, this is a practice that tends to change um, relatively slowly. So we give a relatively long um, time, time span in order to show how this trend has looked. We also show marriage before age, age 15, which tends to, of course, be lower. And this last section um, here gives us a sense of looking ahead to the future, to what it would take to end child marriage, particularly in the context of the SDG target to eliminate the practice by 2030. So what we want to know here is, is the country on track to end child marriage by 2030? And if not, what type of acceleration would be required to meet that goal? Um, I'll just take a minute to explain this chart because it's not, um, not um, always the most intuitive. We're showing an average annual rate of reduction, but basically this, uh, this value is just showing us how fast has the country progressed and how fast would they need to progress in order to meet the target? So what we're looking at in the top two bars is what has been the observed progress? How much progress has the country actually made in reducing child marriage over 25 years and over 10 years? In this case, the fact that the bar is you know, slightly higher over the 10 year period means that they've sped up. That's a bigger, um, a, a faster rate of change. 
And then for comparison, we're showing what type of rate of reduction would be required in order to eliminate the practice by 2030. And here we have this bar that of course is much long, longer, which means the rate of progress would need to be a lot faster in order to reach the target in this case. Um, before I um, hand back um, and uh, transition over to the, to the panel session, um, I just want to wrap up by saying that um, as we think about the, the data that's presented in the profiles, um, we can already kind of brainstorm and have in mind some use cases. Um, we think that the data in the profiles can answer various types of research questions. For example, you know, are child marriage programs in the country targeted to the areas where the practice is most common? Right? This type of data could help us answer that type of question. Um, what type of interventions are most urgently needed to support married girls? You know, here we have this information on how the child brides are faring in terms of reproductive health, empowerment, education. Right? These can kind of give us a sense of what are the, um, the challenges that child brides are facing. What is the relationship between pregnancy and marriage? And would pregnancy prevention avert many child marriages? This is one that I spoke to during that reproductive health um, section. And then in working towards eliminating child marriage, what's what, what might be a reasonable milestone to set given the current trajectory? So this um, question about how fast has the country made progress and what would be required for um, elimination by 2030, this analysis can help us see, you know, what would kind of make sense as a, a milestone to set that's ambitious but achievable along the way. Um, thank you. And with that, I'll hand back over to Nankali. Sorry, colleagues, my, my computer was hanging a little bit. Thank you so much, Colleen, for that. Um, and, and thanks especially not only for sharing the, the, the profiles and what the content is within the profiles, but also that final slide that you shared about, you know, how we can be able to use that um, as, as we go forward in our programming. So colleagues, the next part um, of this meeting is uh, presentations from countries. Um, it's always nice to be able to hear from us, you know, who are sitting at headquarters about the vision. Um, the analysis, but uh, I think perhaps even more important is to understand how these profiles have already been used, um, specifically within the country context. You can be able to learn from that and also others can come in and, and be able to share from that. I want to just also take a quick moment to encourage um, colleagues to please share any questions, clarifications that you have. We have the chat box, we have the Q&A, um, so please feel free to use those platforms or those apps so that you can be able to, to get any questions or clarifications um, from us during the course of this. We'll have a dedicated session for Q&A. So um, the more that you can post in there, the, the better for us. So over to the countries now, I'd like to invite Ibrahim Sesai. He's our Chief of Child Protection at UNICEF Nigeria. One of the people that's kind of leading the work around child marriage globally. Um, would be great to be able to hear from him how these profiles have been used or how they could be used in terms of taking the agenda forward at country level. Ibrahim, over to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Nanx and the rest of the team. First, I really like to register my thanks and appreciation uh, to our their friend uh, who has been supporting us with regards to data. Um, which of course, uh, this has been very invaluable in terms of you know the work that we've been doing. I've sent my short presentation. I hope uh, Colin and uh, uh, Christine, you've got it, so that uh, you'll be able to look at, uh, so that you'll be able to go through what we're doing here in Nigeria. Obviously, when you look at Nigeria, um, it carries the largest burden on child marriage globally after Bangladesh and Ethiopia, which means this is a call to action when you look, see what we really need to do. Um, variably, in terms of numbers, you're talking about 23.6 million children were married or in union before age 18 in Nigeria. So it's it's a very, very important element we need to take into account. Now, we only have seven years, and then that's it in terms of ending the SDGs. So this is really compelling when we really look at um, all the, the data that we currently have, how evidence could really help us to make sure that we'll be able to look at the negative impacts of, on child marriage. Since no, not this one place, go, still go back, leave it that way, it's important. I'm just trying to give a quick intro here. The most important thing is all this data, which of course um, has been um, provided to us by 
colleagues at headquarters has been very, very useful. But at the same time, we've also gone ahead to look at the economic impact with regards to child marriage. Let me, so that I get something good here. In terms of um, the economic impacts of child marriage, uh, increasingly so that uh, uh, governments will be aware of uh, the wide range of development outcomes, which will have been uh, put into some level of investment. Um, you, I, will, I will go through this uh, uh, quickly. Now, we've done an update for Nigeria because um, when you look in terms of the slides that we, the, the, um, the data that we have, we currently have the mixed data in 2021. For children who married before age 18 is 33%. For those before age 15 is 12.3%. Now you start to really look in terms of how this is really panning out. So it's the, the, the burden with regards to child marriage is very, very high in this country. Comparing in terms of, for instance, Niger is 76. That's why you have that big global stuff. But you have states within Nigeria, when it comes to population size, there are even more than Niger whereby they, it's very, very close to that particular average when you look at the 76%. Next slide, please. Now, I will be making three presentations and then later we'll look in terms of programmatic uh, action, policy initiatives, as well as strategic advocacy with the use of the data that we have. In um, we've already done something uh, surrounding ending child marriage study by having this assessment, which was done by uh, Makoro and uh, UNICEF with the initiative, both uh, regional offices, Isaro and uh, Wakar, to, to try to look at uh, the integration of early child marriage policies and plans into government budgets. Because what we already have from the global side is one strength. But as I've mentioned, in order to really have greater commitments towards ending child marriage, demonstrating the negative impacts of the practice and the associated economic costs, we also had to go this extra mile. So this assessment was carried out, that was uh, basically uh, last year. And um, we were able to assess the level of integration of ECM and national sectoral policies and plans in terms of the budgets. Next slide. There are two key recommendations that came in out of this particular piece of work. One was to create a community support for change and, and then in child marriage and then having this into the budgets. So the second recommendation really targeted the national strategy and revision in terms of strengthening the work that is underway in developing a national um, policy and plan. And then the third component under recommendation two was to support ongoing budget reforms agenda in consideration that we will now be having a new government that will be coming in place. And of course, this will really help us to make sure that um, we have to move on with um, this particular uh, 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 work stream. Next slide. Now, the critical thing that we also did was to really now look in terms of the economic impact of child marriage in Nigeria. This is very um, interesting. This was done in 2022 um, for us to look at the burden, but also understanding the consequences of child marriage, specifically on the girl child, family and society as a whole, and across domains within the sectors, such as education and health, the loss of productivity, and which should really give us a, a justification in economic terms, why Nigeria should really invest in ending child marriage. In addition, to the data that colleagues have already mentioned earlier. Next slide. The preliminary findings here, which of course will be very, very important uh, in terms of looking at the economic burden on, on child marriage. Please, let's really take a look at this. It really affirms the association between child marriage, maternal health and child health, low educational attainments. These are three domains that we've been able to really look at. And this is also consistent in terms of the international research based upon the data that we've already received. Now, from here, as a programmer, it starts to tell us that this is a polyvalent approach that we need to look at in terms of a multi-sectoral engagement, both in education and also in terms of health, among others, because this is what the, the data is giving us. And um, an estimated of 3,000, 489 girls, they die before pregnancy. And it will be quite interesting 
Those of you at headquarters, if you could really help us to really look at the comparisons of, uh, of the, some of these data sets that I'm presenting to the, the, the global trends as well, including that of child uh, mortality as a result of child marriage. Economic burden, because this is the centerpiece with regards to the work that we are doing. For 2019, we are in the data that we're looking at. Each year, the consequences of child marriage based upon child health consequences in Nigeria is losing $12.4 billion, $12.4 billion. And then loss in earnings due to child marriage, when we look also in terms of comparative terms, is 2.61 billion, which really accounts to 0.58% um, of the national GDP in Nigeria. Next slide. Now, we've got to keep the promise. How then do we really invest in ending child marriage in Nigeria? Looking at the short time frame that we have, 2013 to 2023 to 2030, like I earlier mentioned, we only have a seven year window. Next slide. Now, let's really look at the data here based upon our mix of 2021 and mix 2016. I particularly concentrate in terms of looking at the blue shades. In 2016, where if we are if we are looking in terms of trends, you'll be able to see that almost all of our, net, our uh, uh, northern states, these are very close to West Niger, and they are part of the Sahel continuum. They are all in blue, which means about 54 to 75 percent of those particular states uh, are. Uh, 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 are those with the heavy burden with regards to child marriage. But I will specifically focus with the data now, which we have in for mix in 2021, which tells us it's about 33.7%, which is basically a three point decrease in terms of a percentage point. Now, if we then look in terms of the Northern states that we have, it's only four of those that is basically on the top, on the top left, is Sokoto, and then you have the base states here, which is basically Yube, uh, Borno, which is on the on the top right on the top right corner, and then the one just beneath it, that is the one which is basically uh, uh, Gombe. So, with all the body that we have in terms of prioritization based upon actions for UNICEF Nigeria, we are looking at Bauchi, which is basically in the on the on the centerpiece on the on the right hand side which is 74% in terms of the burden. As I've mentioned, now you start to really look in terms of distilling this based upon states. As I've mentioned, when you look in terms of uh, Jigawa, for instance, and, uh, and Bauchi combined, that really gives you the entire population for Niger. Uh, uh, and, and then you come to Katsina and the rest as we go. So these are the critical elements or the critical areas, the uh, operational areas, that we are now prioritizing and based upon the actions we need to take. Next slide. The last, which of course um, we will be looking at in terms of programmatic work is the review and the development of a national policy and costed action plan on ending child marriage. This will be between 2023 now to 2030. So we are providing technical support to the efforts of government in terms of the review of the current national policy, and then we'll be able also to have a cost reduction plan on ending child marriage. This hopefully, we're quite uh, uh, optimistic, will address the existing gaps in the previous policy and provide strategic roadmap with a focus on prevention as well as accelerating efforts to end child marriage. Next. Now, this is the heart of the matter. With all this data that we have, what else? What is next? And here we are looking in terms of a multi-sectoral approach, not just looking in terms of development settings, but even also in humanitarian situations, which we currently face as a result of armed conflict within the Northeast. So if we take a look at the top two, which is basically a child-friendly justice sector, integrating that with regards to our social welfare system strengthening with a very high focus in terms of prevention, and addressing the issue in terms of social norm change. Those are the parameters with regards to the work that we will be looking. Mobilizing families and communities, the strengthen the technical capacity, which of course will also include investment in the agency of girls and, uh, and their participation in their well-being. 
And we will also, we've also include child marriage monitoring and reporting mechanisms, including access to integrated social welfare service and the coordination of partnership, including resource mobilization. At the heart of this is policy strategy as well as structural change through institutional partnerships and public financing. So all this work that I've already uh, illust uh, illustrated earlier with regards to economic impacts, with the data that we've already been able to get from headquarters and the, the, the distilling of this data, including the mix, that is what we'll be looking and then in terms of focusing with regards to um, uh, the next uh, program based upon the situation analysis we currently have that will inform us in the development of the next uh, strategy and plan. Within the justice sector, there are five key elements in terms of law reform and, uh, and, and enforcement. But even in terms of law reform and enforcement, we are not just looking within the formal sector. For instance, we have Sharia courts, and then we also have the informal sector. We are in 70% of cases regarding child marriage in terms of settlements are outside of the formal, outside of the formal system. Uh, evidence, data, and research will be another investment, strengthening the judicial infrastructure, expanding services for survivors, as well as access to uh, free legal aid as part of uh, our justice program. But this will uh, be a component or a constituent with regards to what our best will be able to address child marriage in consideration of utilizing the best practice with regards to civil administrative as well as criminal justice system that we face in Nigeria. So the data that we have is really basically consolidating that, taking into account uh, ground realities, capacities of partners, and what should be our leverage in terms of what we can do in Nigeria. So this is our roadmap, and this is the way how we've been doing this, but obviously it's to strengthen, and then of course, which is very critical here, is the child marriage monitoring and reporting mechanism, which really will be looking at a tool for accountability and a springboard for action by government and the various entities that we really need to work. Last slide. I just want to thank you, and then we're ready for a discussion. Hey, thank you so much, Ibrahim. I was about to say, Ibrahim, please, we need to be able to finish. So really glad. Thank you so much for taking us through, you know, that trip of, of uh, Nigeria. It's nice to be able to see how you have been able to not only use uh, the profiles, but also complement them with other pieces of work that are also going on in country, like the economic cost work uh, and, and many others to be able to determine a pathway for how Nigeria can be able to deliver on the elimination um, goal for child marriage. So thank you so much, Ibrahim. And please do stay online so that uh, people can be able to come back and ask questions and do check the Q&A. I can see uh, questions which were being pointed at you because of uh, people enjoying the presentation that you did. So let me now turn over to the India team, the UNICEF India team. We have Robin Habash Singh and Mary Thomas coming in for the India team. Kais, are you still there? Yes, yeah. we are here. Excellent. Please, let me hand over to you to also share experience from the India perspective. Over to you guys. Um, are you able to see my screen, uh, my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, to start off, uh, we are going to talk about um, uh, how we have used uh, evidence from the country profile uh, in our advocacy. Um, to start with, uh, uh, talking about India first, just a little bit. Um, so, India is a, a large, diverse country, uh, which is a federal uh, country. There are uh, 36 states and territories, um, and these uh, states uh, have very large differences. Uh, I have shown the child marriage uh, rates uh, there of West Bengal, which is the highest at 42%. This is the percentage of 20 to 24 year old women who were married before the age of 18. Um, and the lowest uh, is Lakshwadeep at 1%. So there is a high difference. Uh, there are differences uh, in society, culture, economies of these states. Uh, for example, a state in the West uh, is likely to have a GDP per capita 10 times higher than a state in the East like uh, Bihar. Um, so uh, that's one. Uh, we have the largest adolescent population uh, in the world that is uh, at 250 million uh, adolescents. Um, and the, our child marriage rate is at 23.3%. Again, this is the percentage of 20 to 24 year old women who got married before the age of 18. 
uh, we have the second highest population, of course, that is known to uh, many of you. And uh, in fact, even if we talk about one of our states, for example, Uttar Pradesh, if it was if it was a country, then it would have been the eighth highest, uh, eighth most populous uh, country in the world. Um, okay, going uh, forward, uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, our advocacy. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at advocacy, what are we? Who are we uh, advocating to? Um, so this uh, basically this socio-ecological model just I have just uh, put in on it's not a comprehensive list of uh, stakeholders but I put in the most important ones uh, and um, it also shows the multiple levels of advocacy that we have to do in the country so it's starting from the district level to the central government this is the uh, the people that we would be doing evidence-based advocacy with of course uh, below that the, at the community family and adolescent level it would be more awareness generation so more SPCC kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, awareness building. Um, and on the right hand side, I have written the objectives of uh, the objectives of uh, our advocacy and the, they are very straightforward. The first is we want to raise an end, uh, you know, the attention and the interest of uh, the government, the first the stakeholders in the issue of child marriage in the country. Uh, we want higher resource allocation. If you see the graphs below on the right, then um, in the last decade, India has shown a decreasing uh, percentage allocation to children uh, and a child protection budget is even smaller, a very small fraction of that uh, allocation. Uh, and the third uh, uh, objective of advocacy has to be uh, the better targeting, more uh, effective, uh, more targeted um, programming. Uh, so I've taken, uh, I have divided the presentation into the objectives, so it is easier to understand. Um, I have taken uh, screenshots from the country profile itself. Uh, so uh, the first was, uh, the first, I mean, two tactics which we use a lot is quantifying and comparing, of course. Um, so quantifying is more intuitive than just giving a percentage. The percentage tends to be used a lot for 23.3%. After a while, it stops meaning as much to uh, the stakeholders. So giving it a number like 226.3 million uh, women were married as, uh, as, uh, as children, that, uh, that, gives, uh, that is more intuitive, gives us scope of the problem. And plus, it's also easier than we can talk to the government or to the stakeholders about how uh, you know, these uh, women uh, are likely to have less education, likely to uh, not have a saving bank account, uh, likely to not use a mobile phone for messaging or won't be able to use chatbots if that's a part of programming. So we can talk a lot about, a lot about uh, these particular group of women when we quantify it. Um, a caveat is that when we did go to the government and we gave them these numbers, they actually wanted us to show what is the number that were avoided that, uh, that their marriage did not take place because of the reduction that uh, the country has shown in the last 20 years. So uh, they, that became a talking point for the government. Um, so, uh, and on the, of course, comparing, um, as you can see, always great, India is a country which is, uh, which is growing in economy and it is getting more visibility. So comparison is obviously a better way, at least at the central level, people, you know, take these comparisons uh, more seriously. <coughs> uh, uh, so uh, the early uh, childbearing or teenage pregnancy, as it's called in India, uh, is, is uh, so correlating with issues such as teenage pregnancy, which tends to be more of a focus area for the government because, of course, uh, it has uh, more immediate health concerns, maternal mortality, infant mortality. So. Uh, correlating with the, the child marriage with the teenage pregnancy actually is advantageous to us, gives us uh, more talking points. And uh, we can see that, you know, uh, girls who got married uh, as children are much more likely uh, to be uh, underage and pregnant. So, uh, so that gives us a great point for advocacy. Moving on to resource allocation, as I already showed you the graphs, we have degrees. Um, so this graph, as Colleen also highlighted, I mean, uh, we, uh, so the way we say it is that India would need to 
uh, India would need to increase uh, or India would need to uh, be reducing the child marriage rate at a rate that is four times higher than what it is currently doing. Uh, and that is why uh, if we are to meet the SDG targets, uh, which in, in, in India has endorsed. So, uh, so, so that is, uh, I mean, that is the reason why we are asking for uh, more funding. Uh, the, the government tends to highlight that since we are already uh, reducing the rate, the child marriage rate, uh, then why, I mean, what is the need of uh, increasing? They lose that interest. So that uh, the, what our uh, talking point there is, that the last 20% is usually the hardest because those are the community of people where um, the issue is more entrenched. The, the barriers are much harder to be, uh, to, you know, uh, to break. And so moving forward. Uh, okay. Um, so this is uh, basically where uh, the comparison of all the states of the country and their child marriage, respective child marriage rates. Uh, um, I have highlighted the UNICEF program districts with the with the transparent boxes. Um, so uh, this has when we take the, take this to the when we talk about the high burden states, the the government actually uh, sent. A, letter to the high burden states saying that you need to uh, you know uh, you need to take care what are the programs that you are doing to end child marriage uh, and as you can see all the high high burden states are part of uh, unicef's uh, program uh, state as well in fact um, we go a little even further when we are advocating with states we talk about we have identified districts which are high prevalent districts and you know ge geographies which are high prevalence in child marriage and we talk to them about uh, making sub national plans uh, uh, district plans which um, which uh, address child marriage uh, we also talk about constitution of task force at the sub national level which can take a holistic view of child marriage in those localities and uh, uh, and th that's how the programming is uh, envisioned Uh, talking about uh, the population, and uh, I think this this graph is very telling. When we uh, okay, so the first one clearly shows that the poorest families, uh, the adolescent girls in the poorest families, are three times more likely uh, uh, than richer families to be uh, wed as children, and uh, uh, hence, uh, you know, this is a talk, great talking point for cash transfer programs or cash plus programs uh, because they will be more effective because clearly wealth is a driver. I mean, poverty is the driver of child marriage. Uh, secondly, uh, I mean, the, the second part of the graph which shows the uh, level of education. Uh, so we, we see that, of course, no education, uh, the I mean, the girl is likely to be uh, married as a child. But the other thing is primary because of the universalization of primary education in India, a lot of the girls who get married young uh, tend to have primary education. So this, uh, this means that uh, we can do adolescent empowerment programs in primary uh, schools um, and we should get good results. Also, uh, this is all obviously a case for continued education programs, uh, programs that ensure that the girl child keeps in school or are retained back uh, which uh, I think would be very effective uh, in addressing child marriage in India. Uh, talking about some of the results that we have been able to achieve through our advocacy, um, we use the, the, the evidence from the country profile extensively in building a narr narrative when the GPCM steering committee was here in um, November. And uh, they have, uh, and it was a successful meeting because uh, the steering committee uh, increased the scope of programming in, for the country. So that was uh, definitely a win. Um, secondly, we have, because of the letter from the center to the states uh, or, and the states themselves then uh, working uh, and working on evidence, uh, they had held their discussion and they re revised their 
programs on child marriage. For example, West Bengal has a very extensive plan a uh, program called Kanya Shri, which, which has a cash plus component as well. So they took a look, took a stock of that program and why it's not working as well as they thought. And they made some tweaks to the program as well uh, in consultation with UNICEF. Um, thirdly, uh, the revision, uh, a lot of the, the child protection uh, scheme of the country now, it's, they, the central government has revised it into mission mission which have better targets, uh, more well-defined targets. And these are umbrella uh, schemes which take care of all child protection. So there is, there is definitely more focus by the central governments towards child protection issues. Um, the fourth one is uh, the BT Bachao, BT Padao, Triple BP as we call it, which literally translates to Save Girl Child, Educate Girl Child, which is a program, which is the flagship uh, adolescent girl program of uh, of uh, of India, so they with consult in consultation with UNICEF, the government has revised the guidelines. Uh, a photo of it is right here, on the right, um, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, now a much uh, much more comprehensive uh, guideline, which which clearly states what is required of each uh, state and district. Um, the last is the geographical prioritization of high burden states, even into high burden districts. Uh, so that is something that uh, we have seen happen um, because of our advocacy. Um, now, Mary, what do you want to add? Yeah, sure. Uh, just I think, you know, given the diversity of India and in terms of you've seen that, you know, the prevalence rate of the country where we've seen, you know, above 40 percent and 1 percent, uh, the evidence really helps us to one, uh, you know, look at different flagships of the program where child marriage can be embedded or is already embedded. And in terms of being able to make an investment case of why some of these interlinkages have to be looked in, in terms of child marriage with pregnancy, with continuing schooling. So this evidence has been very rich. In fact, uh, the, the ministry has had a revamping of its own missions under which different schemes have been kind of streamlined. And the analysis that we've done in UNICEF has really helped in terms of looking at some of the linkages and streamlining of these missions and across also looking at different flagship programs like Rohan mentioned in terms of the Beti Bajao, where uh, as much as emphasis on child marriage was there, but also the convergence of different departments to be able to work. And that in terms of being informed by the evidence uh, of, that has come out has been very useful as well. Uh, the second bit is I think in terms of, you know, as Rohan mentioned, that given when you see a larger decline in the country, but the requirement of higher prioritization of at the subnational level, you know, where are the hotspots? The evidence is really helpful in terms of being able to look at tailored strategies for different social groups. Uh, and overall also in terms of, uh, you know, we've seen that how the analysis has helped us in terms of being able to inform state action plans, uh, see uh, increased, uh, budget commitments in terms of at the subnational levels as well. So that has been a clear one as we see in, uh, in the cash transfer scheme in uh, West Bengal. Uh, overall, I think just in terms of uh, also uh, having a sound case in terms of donor investments, uh, it's also helped us in being able to build that. Uh, so yeah, uh, we'll stop there and thank you so much. Thank you so much to both Rohan and Mary. Really great to be able to hear, um, you know, how that data has been used and also, you know, to influence policy, to influence programmatic approach, um, to influence even where we, we target geographically, um, et cetera. So colleagues, um, we had promised to be able to do a game. Um, unfortunately, time is not on our side. And so what we'd like to do, you know, before we bring this to an end is to be able to hear from you. What kind of questions and clarifications? I'm really glad to uh, see people already posting questions in the Q&A. And I know that um, Colleen has been giving it a go in terms of, you know, responding to the questions that have been that have already been put up there. So, you know, this this is the time to be able to hear if there's anything you feel has not been shared, has not been addressed. I've seen questions about, you know, will the presentations be shared? Yes, absolutely. We will be sharing, you know, the presentations and the links to where you can be able to find um, the profiles during the course of either today or tomorrow so colleagues can be able to use this but please um can we hear from you feel free to put your hand up uh feel free to speak up and i can i can certainly call on call on you so that you can share with us your perspectives or, or ask questions um about this and thanks so much to everyone who's already taken time to post within um the q a 
Um, Colleen, I don't know whether you want to um, kick off with, with any, um, any of the answers that you've already posted on, just to get the ball rolling for people. Of course, yes, thank you. And I'll, I'll keep trying to um, answer some questions also um, in, in this chat over here. Um, a couple of the questions just from a practical sense that have come in are about, um, you know, which countries will be available? Um, how can we, you know, understand significance of the data? So just to say we've started right now, I think there are 81 countries that are posted um, with data on the website. This is out of about 130 countries in total that have data on child marriage prevalence. So that the 80 that were prioritized were those that have the highest prevalence, the highest burden, um, and of course, those that have data sets available for analysis, right? We need to be able to actually analyze the data in order to, to produce the profile. We are going to be looking to expand this list of 80, you know, over the coming over the coming year. So if you don't see your country yet, it might be coming. Also, feel free to reach out if you have a particular um, need, and we can make sure that you're on on the list. Um, or in case that the data is not available, we can talk about that as well. One other note on interpretation, which I think is important, I didn't mention this before, is that um, we do not include um, confidence intervals in the analysis, which means that we, um, if you're interpreting the data, um, the a difference you know, in, in values might not be statistically significant. So this is a note of, of caution. If you um, have a particular you know, need um, or question about whether a result is significant or not, please feel free to reach out and we can look at the underlying data. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, I see a colleague from Malawi, Zioni Ntaba, uh, with her hand raised up. Zioni, please, over to you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask how much of that data has looked at in terms of how the child marriages are ending up in the courts. I work in the courts. I'm a judge of the high court, but I also do a lot of programming for the Women Judges Association, which works on a lot of these GBV cases as they come through the civil justice space and the criminal space. And it is always interesting that the child marriage aspect is not considered uh, in terms of data as they come through the, in terms of the court, apart from the fact that they come through the police. I wanted, I was interested to see how much of that data looked at uh, the effect of it in terms of the children who now have to seek remedies once they out of these, these marriages or who seek remedies for violations during the marriages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zioni. Anybody else with questions out there? Or Colleen, can I hand that over to you? Um, sure. Well, to say, I, I would start by saying um, that's a, it's a very interesting question. The the way that the data um, come to us in in terms of the child marriage kind of reporting mechanism, we're not looking at um, child marriage cases that were you know reported um, as violations. Although, of course, they are you know violations, and in many cases are illegal um, as well. Um, the way that the that the data um, are collected is actually that we are looking at um, population based um, surveys and asking, you know, a representative sample of, of women, at what age were they first married or first lived with a partner. So we're not catching the cases in the moment as each one of them happens, but rather we're looking at the full population and understanding, you know, at what age did you first get married? So we're looking at those who are, they're now adults um, and they can report on what happened to them in the past. Over. Thanks, thanks so much, Colleen. And thanks so much, Dioni, for bringing up the case about, you know, the data that's, that's in the court systems and um, just to say that, you know, we're, we're not only working on this national level data, but also looking at how to strengthen administrative data as well, of which we consider this to be, you know, a part of the work that we're doing as well. So thanks so much for highlighting that point. Mercy Okeke, I see your hand up. Please come in. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Mercy, and I work with Girls Not Brides, the global partnership to end child marriage. I'm based in Nigeria currently working with the National Coalition on Ending Child Marriage in Nigeria. And I would like to know how soon the plans um, for the review of the national strategy to end child marriage in Nigeria will be reviewed. So how soon are the plans happening? How soon will the plans be set in place? Um, because we heard last year that um, the plans had started, but we hadn't heard anything back. Um, after, you know, all the initial processes. So we just would like an update on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mercy. Ibrahim, are you still logged on? Could you please respond to that question? 
Yeah, um, thank you so much, Marcy. This is Ibrahim from UNICEF. Obviously, um, we already have our uh, conversation with the ministry, you know, since they are the chair, we acting as co-chair for the uh, National um, uh, Coordination Committee. So um, the recruitment of consultants and uh, how best we could really work on this is now ongoing. And uh, we are really targeting ourselves between now and June so that the uh, cost plans as well as the strategy should be completed. Over. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, Colleen, I see a question about regional profiles. Yes, I see that as well. Um, so the, the question is whether regional profiles are or will be available. Um, we've handled regional profiles on, um, on child marriage a bit differently. And actually, maybe first I can check with the person who asked the question. When we say region, do we mean like a macro region like South Asia, or do we mean a sub-region of a country? Because I've understood this as the larger region, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. I'm not sure who asked this question. Anyway, I'll go ahead and answer as if it's the larger macro region. Um, we have, so the, these country profiles as a particular resource were designed to be um, country level data. So this template is applicable for, for countries. We have produced and are producing many um, regional profiles on child marriage as well. Just last year, we did um, kind of a full, full publications for both um, East and Southern Africa and West and Central Africa. We are working on one for South Asia right now, which should be released hopefully in the first quarter. Um, and in the past, we have done profiles for Middle East and North Africa, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean. So in the past few years, we've covered most of the world um, and we can um, share a links to these in the chat for those who are interested. Thanks for that response, um, Colleen. I see another question on how we can work on disasters impacting child marriage. I'm really happy to see this question, and I'm sure Colleen will share our age-old discussion. We keep talking within here, climate change, humanitarian crisis, etc. So just for colleagues to know that it is a topic of discussion within here, but Colleen can certainly come in and say, you know, what are the plans, what's the thinking for 2023? Thank you. Yes, um, with, this is yeah an area of great interest. We know that that girls who are experiencing this triple crisis of um, of COVID, climate change, and and conflict are are at you know are, are in a particularly vulnerable place um, that could have an impact on their their risk of child marriage. Um, we are working on an analysis, doing some modeling of you know what does that risk look like? How how much is the risk increased um, in, in these cases? Um, and so, yeah, so we're seeing, you know, for example, you know, based on um, individual climate shocks, how many more child brides could we, you know, could we expect or for in the cases of conflicts, you know, how long the conflict goes on, you know, how much would that set back a country in terms of their progress on child marriage. So that's the type of analysis that we're that we're working on and it's to come later this later this year. Okay, brilliant, colleagues. Something to look forward to during the course of 2023. Ibrahim, I see you've got your hand up. Please come in. Yes, um, I will specifically talk about issues with regards to child marriage, armed conflict, and climate change. And uh, my reference point here is basically the Central Sahel. Um, I think a week ago, we, we, we had our regional advisor who was also here with us and uh, Cornelius. We've been trying to really look in terms of the relationships, and it's quite amazing. When you look in terms of the data that is contained, you know, uh, the work done by Claudia, and then you really put all of that data across the Sahel, this is where you start to really see that issues with regards to risk vulnerabilities and deprivations, and the numbers where really the concentration points really needs to be in is basically within this particular middle belt starting from way in um, uh, Mauritania, the, uh, the upper end of uh, Senegal, and then moving you way towards um, Somalia, Djibouti, as well as Eritrea, you know, right across that band. And um, I will see that um, this will be quite important because the data is quite available. It's just an issue of illustration. And then uh, looking in terms of um, the, um, the interface, when you really look in terms of some of all of the service factors and how they really pan out in terms of uh, providing 
this sort of stuff, which is which is quite interesting. It's a whole PhD thesis on this, anyways. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Ibrahim. And we have no doubt that Nigeria will be leading and looking at some of that analysis. So, colleagues, um, just to say, you know, much gratitude from my side. I'm now going to hand over to Colleen to to close. I hope that this has been useful. We've seen that there's been some questions that we haven't answered, and we look to see how we can be able to answer those. And just to reaffirm that all the presentations. Um, and everything will be available for you to be able to reach out. Really glad to all the people who made time today to be able to join us. Thank you so much from my end and over to you, Colleen. Thank you, Nankali. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're always really excited. We're excited to make these you know, data-driven products and we're even more excited to see that there's enthusiasm for, you know, for using them for practical use, which is, is why we do this work. Um, I also want to, in particular, thank our panelists today. Um, I was uh, really excited to hear um, from our colleagues, both in Nigeria and India, about how they've you know, used these, um, use the analysis for action. They've used the analysis to spur additional ideas for, you know, for more analysis and really how they've been able to use the data in order to um, really make a strong case to their respective governments. Um, thinking about, you know, what are the what are the strongest talking points? Um, how can they really make some tight messages that are that are um, influential um, in taking action towards ending child marriage? This is this is why we why we do it. Um, thank you very much to everyone, and with that, we'll, we will close for today. Bye, colleagues. Thank you so much.